Welcome to Idle Red Hands Weekly. I'm Jeremy. I'm Chris. And what is Idle Red Hands Weekly? It is when someone takes it upon themselves to decide who does or does not have access or rights to a community or identity. Isn't that gatekeeping? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's not us. But. <laughs> All right, I hope that's not us. Okay. <laughs> I uh, was thinking about that because of Gen Con was, hmm. uh, just happened. And it's very funny. There is no point in gatekeeping, especially something owned by Hasbro or any of these types of hobbies anymore, because the corporations that own these are very interested in broadening their customer base as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So they are actually not interested in you doing that. And in fact, inclusion and diversity in that hobby is what they want. That's good for their bottom line. So they're going to push that as hard as possible. So I think that is where we're kind of getting this friction between OSR kind of old school people that do that did protect this hobby as this is a geek pastime and mm. the newer generation of people that are being welcomed by the broader kind of corporate face. Overlords? Yeah, yeah, overlords. <laughs> the corporate overlords of uh, Hasbro are more interested than anything to get new audiences and a new generation involved. So it's funny, though, that uh, as much as the maybe new generation of people feel, yeah, now this is finally for us. Mm. It's for you because, you know, you're adding to the bottom line. It's not actually, they don't want to lose the old audience. Right. They're, not, they're not changing audiences. They're just opening, you know, opening the door a little wider because they want more people to come through. And so I think there's a, with a lot of hobbies and, you know, kind of fandoms and things, I think there is a, a weird mentality that I think eventually it, it's affecting people subconsciously because eventually they are just realizing they're being used. They're, you're just paying. Give us your money and go the heck away. No, 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 no. But I want to write fan fiction. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, cease and desist. You know, I want to do this. You know, I, you want to be involved. So it's almost this abusive relationship that some people have lived their whole life from very young childhood in where they like these characters. Like, okay, just just buy the goods and go the heck away. You're not participating in this. You're a customer. Do you think that's the case, though? What with like the DMs Guild? I mean, using the D&D analogy, mm -hmm. the DMs Guild is essentially a marketplace that D&D &D and Hasbro have set up through mm. drive through RPG, where people can essentially sell their fan fiction. Oh, yeah. They get, I mean, the corporate overlords get a decent, decent, huge mm -hmm. cut and... I mean, I think there's better places to sell your your stuff. Maybe not for D and D, mm -hmm. but in terms of like gatekeeping, I agree. For games like D and D, mm -hmm. didn't want to say that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. They're they're owned by a corporation, and so it behooves the corporation to get as many people mm -hmm. as customers as possible. Right. For other types of games that sort of don't have that corporate overlord thing, I guess you know, kind of indie games. Sure, I guess it's it's the same thing. You know, designers. If they want to be paid for their stuff, the more audience or the larger audience they have, the more revenue they're going to get. Mm -hmm. And but in terms of like the gatekeeping thing, I, I think sure there's the kind of herd mentality of we all like this thing and that's all great and let's all stick together. And yeah, on, I, I don't understand the and you can't join. Mm. I mean, unless that person's a bad actor, in which case we don't want you. We don't want your your bad vibes in this community. Right. I guess I do kind of understand people who've invested a lot and this kind of gets into like system mastering stuff to, to bring it back to role playing games mm -hmm. I've devoted so much time to studying and mastering this thing and you just joined uh, and there's okay. got to be some and, and, and I don't think but people think there's got to be some kind of distinction between me and you otherwise mm. it's, it's the same with comic books or any kind of fandom as you said Marvel whatever I've been a fan of this for however long and you just joined and we cannot be equal because mm. then the amount of time and effort and energy i've put into studying and learning this thing is meaningless yep, and that's true i get why that's upsetting mm -hmm. the other day it doesn't fucking matter <laughs> it's made of, right just like mm -hmm. i agree it's hard to let go of and i guess if you're talking role-playing games especially what satanic panic and getting tossed in the lockers and stuff there's the mm. understandably but not correct the resentment of it becoming mainstream mm -hmm. and not getting that kind of abuse and going through. And I understand some people would take that badly and kind of turn it around being like, no, you can't join because you didn't go through this whatever hazing period. Right. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's a good point, too, is, yeah, when you join. And it's kind of like they know how sports fans don't like the uh, bandwagon jumpers when yeah, their, yeah, their yeah. team is you know, going to the Super Bowl or their World Series. Yeah, that kind of stuff is, is so frustrating because we were there when they were losing. Yep. 
<laughs> or if you're in, from Philadelphia, it's like not when the Eagles are gonna get bad. It's not if it's it's when. It's just right. like okay, how long in the season before they crap? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm a sports fan, but <laughs> yeah. So it's almost like people need some kind of designation, some kind of letters to put after their name to show how authentically you know how how long they've been involved in their hobby and how. I mean, you can't get a PhD in it, but I'm sure if people could, they would. Uh, yeah, PhD in in uh, Dungeons well, I mean, and Dragons. <laughs> don't people kind of do? I mean, how many Reddit posts or whatever posts are? But I've been DMing for 10, 20, 30, 40 mm-hmm. years. And the realization, like, dude, that doesn't mean you're good at it necessarily. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. mean you're bad at it, but. Yeah, it's funny. And it is just a hobby, but yeah, people feel very territorial. It's not just a hobby. Oh, that's it's d d Come on, get it right. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess bringing up Gen Con, I'll, uh, I'll bring this up. So there was something, <laughs> yeah, there was something that uh, that I was amused by that I think a lot of people weren't, and it has a lot to do with just like we where we had the controversy at the UK Games mm. Expo, and we're talking about mainstream and kind of corporately owned, corporately run things. They want to broaden this as much as possible. They want to make it family friendly because they don't want people to not be able to come just because they need to push a stroller. Right. So you know, br- you know, well, they- based on the number of people attending, I would not want to push a stroller <laughs> through that morass of yes. unwashed gamer flesh. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, that would. Be be pretty traumatic i think i think that is child abuse <laughs> oh, uh, so the creator i, I don't, don't have his name down oh here. james raggy yes yes the creator of lamentations of the flame princess printed a catalog and the cover featured some art with the title kids on pikes so instead of kids on bikes the you know kind of stranger things right uh, there's, there's a, a role-playing game called kids on bikes as well Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that created by the 80s nostalgia Mm -hmm. filtered through people that were born in the 90s. Yeah, Uh, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. It's that softer, gentler kind of role play. So it's when somebody tried to make it dark and ugly uh, using uh, things from the flood Mm. at um, the UK Games Expo, we ran into this. And then this creator does darker, edgy, <laughs> edgier settings. <laughs> Did you hear the air quotes on that one for me? Yeah. <laughs> settings for fantasy. And so using this provocative image, I mean, it was very amusing to me because... So you didn't say what it was. It's the, oh, sorry. Kid, it's, the, it's the four kids from Stranger Things with... As literally heads on pikes, uh, well, bodies. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh. They're, they're they're impaled like Vlad the Impaler style. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you you can't see their faces, but you obviously see it's Dustin with his hat right. and curly okay, hair. Okay. Yeah, so, so sorry, it's the kids from Stranger Things impaled on pikes with a character like drinking wine or something below them. Okay. So very much saying, you know, this is not our version. You know, this is right. our, our nostalgia, and so. You know, the, the title and the the content i liked it it was it was a little punk rock it was a little edgy it was just like you know we're not into this if you want that kind of if you know if you, if you want to that warm and fuzzy thing that's not what we do mm. but the fact that it was put on the cover of a catalog that's a free giveaway that's a little bit difficult because they're going to be handing it straight to people that might have a pretty you know serious reaction might be, might be with their kids at the time and say oh right. you, you got murdered kids on the front of your is this is this what you're all about but um, I, th- I would say the answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it tickled me because um that's my reaction I mean I I am kind of disgusted by that's you know be- become kind of a face of Role playing and things. Oh, oh it's, Stranger it's Things. Of, yeah, yeah, it's kind of retro. Yeah, that that you know, the kids on bikes. It's safe. It's gentle. And you know, Tales from the Loop is a good system that doesn't have any death. That is probably a good kind of gateway for people that want to try RPGs that don't want to stick swords and goblins' okay, yeah. faces. But at, at the same time, that can't be it. That can't be all there is. Mm. You know. So I just liked it as a, a statement of uh, we're still here. We're still messed up. You know, we we still got some problems. We still like weird stuff. And I like that that image exists. <laughs> That's fair. As you said, though. Mm-hmm. With Gen Con trying to be more family friendly, yes, it's not censorship because Gen Con is not the government. Mm-hmm. So Gen Con would be, I think, well within its rights to be right to be like, yeah, no, you're you're not giving that out. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and and that's come up many times in uh, comic cons, is you know mostly my experience, and uh, that comes up a lot because as things get bigger and more friendly, like they're putting. Post-it notes mm. over nipples on fantasy art, you know, so art dealers and things have to deal with this sort of thing. And I think what then needs to happen is you break off an indie show. You right, break right. off you break off a, a separate show that people know this is. And, and so then you don't have all the bullshit. You don't have mm. any kids on bikes, you know, at, at your indie dark RPG con right, or whatever right. you're going to call it. So that you still have access to that. And it's not going to be in contrast, you know, to a, a family friendly thing. It's because you don't want it to be in opposition and you don't want to have to be behind a, a curtain, right. you know. At a show, I mean that is a, a, an option, but that that does kind of end up kind of segregating you and kind of marginalizing the people that want to make that those kind of games. And I think it's it's valid; they're valid to play, they're valid to create, mm-hmm. but they're not valid to try to you know put in kids' right. faces. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, you can make whatever you want, but you kind of then have to face the consequences. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, 
this show isn't geared towards the stuff I make and it right. stinks that it's the largest one that I want to participate in and my sales or whatever are going to go down and having to go to this other smaller or start my own kind of thing. But mm-hmm. it's like, you made that choice. Yeah. You, you oh, decided yeah. to do that. So that's kind of what you got to deal with, unfortunately. I have feelings since Lamentations of the Flame Princess is one of the few RPGs that I actually kind of wanted my money back after getting. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I was I was very <laughs> impressed by your description of the, the free PDF versus oh, the, yeah, pay, right, the paid right. version. That's what, that's what got it. <laughs> it was like, uh, yeah, after buying it for about like 20 bucks or something like that, found out there's a free artless PDF version that is exactly the same product just with white spaces over the art so and as i was not that impressed with the system or the artwork really to be all that honest i felt i paid 20 dollars for artwork that i did not like right so, <laughs> that and uh numenera mm. are among the rpg pdfs i wish i had my money back on yeah. wow well, I'm sure the list will continue to grow. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully I've, I've going to make good decisions from now on. So how about you this week? Anything? Apart from getting some blank dice to run mm. an alien RPG at the end of this month, not a whole lot because my kid is being a real pain in the butt. <laughs> so there's not a lot of time for me to do stuff. I ordered, what, 40 blank dice from the dice shop online. Mm. It's a, a UK retailer. And they arrived pretty quickly. And it was, what, less than 20 bucks? for 40 blank dice, including international shipping to Japan, which normally is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, I got 20 black, 10 yellow, and 10 red, uh, because I couldn't decide what color I wanted the stress dice for Alien to be. Um, The black and the yellow contrast really well, Mm -hmm. but the black and the red also, I mean, red stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what I got to do now is paint the symbols on them. Mm. Haven't decided what those are going to be yet, but it should be fairly easy. Cool. Yeah, I was curious. Um, I was wondering if you knew something I didn't know about the system because they haven't released the the full rules yet. And when I saw you had two different colors that weren't black, I was like, oh, are they going to do gear dice? Because the Forbidden Land system, oh, right. yeah, you, you have to separate skills, gear, and your kind of core. Core dice are separate colors. So I was like, oh, is the system going to be that different between cinematic and campaign play? Interesting. Yeah. interesting. I didn't and, know that. I just couldn't decide mm. whether I wanted the, the red or the yellow for stress dice. And nice. it, as it was only like three bucks mm-hmm. i just said why not okay mm, but yeah. like how quickly how do the gear dice work in forbidden lands when you fail you have to pay attention to what die failed okay so when you're rolling the um the attributes so if you're rolling strength for a physical attack mm-hmm. or agility for a uh, ranged attack you actually take damage to that stat right so okay. you, you gain a condition that is you know you're weakened or you're if it's a mental if you've done something with empathy mm. Or wisdom, you have a, a mental effect or you have a movement effect if it's agility. But if your gear rolls, if your gear fails, then you take damage to that gear. Okay. And so gear only has a certain amount of dur- durability. Right. Okay. And so you can break things using mm. them. And then uh, with skills, failure doesn't matter. Right. With, with a specific you, you can't skill lose your, your skill ability. Right. right. Okay. But that's how they kind of track your, your damage and then wear on your right. gear. And I think it also is true with uh, armor. If you, okay. roll, if you fail on an armor roll, that means your armor is getting damaged. So you can basically have it yeah, stripped away. <laughs> (laughs) Well, that kind of makes sense for that setting. I mean, because like gear is, you have to replace swords and shields and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. I didn't see that in the the Alien cinematic Mm -hmm. RPG, but I mean, probably do it. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I would, though, because I think, uh, as we were discussing before, the the roles for consumables like Mm -hmm. power, oxygen, ammo, Mm -hmm. I think that already kind of fills that area of your gear is not, might not might not last that long or you're going to have to go get that reload for the the incinerator or oh you're out of o2 kind of stuff so i would be surprised if they also toss in those gear dice maybe they will who knows Mm. yeah i hope not i don't think so because i think the way that it's working right now is nice i'm just i'm curious to see how uh, character creation is going to work hopefully the system will stay mostly the same because uh, i think it works and i think relying really heavily on that stress mechanic you know to kind of Mm. bring tension up but when you're playing a campaign i'm curious how much that actually kicks in and yep. like you know if you're gonna we've been here for a week and i've been freaking out for a week mm. <laughs> that's that's a little odd so um we'll, we'll see like how that changes in uh, yeah i'm really curious to see the the campaign play i'm almost kind of after seeing cinematic i'm kind of skeptical of what it's going to be like mm. i might try and reverse engineer some of the characters in that cinematic mm-hmm. thing as well because i think i'm going to strip out first names and like the original alien script just have yes. family name be like yeah. I like that, not yeah. make any kind of association about like gender or pronoun. Just like here's, uh, the, here's yeah. the name, whatever you want, kind of want to be. Mm-hmm. Maybe even take out the picture as you did for the black and white character sheets. You made. Right, right, yeah. No, I think that uh, I think that works well. That was the the problem because I was using the genders that they kind mm-hmm. of preassigned, and we didn't switch anybody over. And uh, but I think that works well, and I think that's much easier to remember when you're. Uh, so we kind of used family name when we were 
mm -hmm. character. Yeah, yeah. I think that worked. And yeah, I think that's very appropriate to the setting, too. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's how most of the movies run. Even Newt was yelling, Ripley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be no kids. Yeah. <laughs> Surprised they actually put a kid in the cinematic start. I was like, yeah. wow, okay, if that happened, no, I'm not getting used. Cause yeah, that was very, yeah, so th I ended up using that for your, the picture of your younger brother yeah, with yeah, cancer. Yeah, that's why I, yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I didn't think that was going to come up. He was basically going to stay on the ship yeah, yeah, and yeah, not come great. up. Yeah. <laughs> not putting a 12 year old on this horrible science vessel with, yeah. with, with an incinerator. I think he's. Oh, yeah, it's exactly the incinerator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spoilers for Chariot of the God <laughs> cinematic starter. <laughs> For me this week, I was speaking of foolish decisions. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> I've invested in some contrast paints and some of the new Citadel contrast paints. Which is what exactly? So that's the new style of thick as you want, throw it on one coat, and it's going to give you a highlight. It's going to give you a, the effect of a wash, and it'll give you like a transition. And so that's basically they're kind of coming up with a, a combined version of a glaze. It's kind of a glaze okay. and a um, wash together. And so for the the details on the uh, the Citadel miniatures, which are really nice, you know, nice and fine. You can basically just base them in a primer made specifically for this paint. So I think it's got some tooth or texture on okay. it. And then you just hit it with that color and it, the, the pigment pulls away. So okay. at the highest okay. highest surface, it pulls away, giving you a highlight. It, it sits in the recesses like a wash does, right. okay. but it gives you a transition. Um, and I've seen... I've seen kind of various results and the whole range doesn't seem to be working very well because of course the pigment is different material. You know, mm. the pigment for each color is different material so it all operates a little bit differently. You mean among the contrast paints yes, themselves? With, within, yeah, within okay. the contrast paints it does seem that, you know, whatever the chemical or compound is that is the pigment, it reacts a little bit differently between right. colors. For some of the uh, the browns and earth tones and even the skin tones, they're getting really nice oh, results. Wow. Yeah. So this is how I've decided to try to approach the orc uh, the orc army that I invested in last Orctober. <laughs> Orctober. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> and because uh, I really like the the more organic, not not such bright green right. uh, orc color, and they've got some really nice greens in there, and then of course all the the leather and mm. and the uh, you know black and everything. Um, Don't forget all the dirty metal, all the yes. like tin bits and stuff. Right. Right. So I think I think it'll work well in a combination of those things. Uh, I was really curious to try it, and the the one worry that I had is so orcs have a lot of vehicles and mm. with big broad that surfaces. That should be red. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> And that these paints do not work well. They're made for a very small, very mm. detailed, because it needs some place to, to Go. grab onto. Yeah, yeah. Right. So a big, broad surface, it looks terrible. Like people have had. Does it look mottled and kind of like it, spotty? Or? It, 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 it looks like, yeah, like watercolory. It's like, it's hmm. like it. It pools in weird, unpredictable ways. It doesn't add anything that looks like a, a natural light or anything. Right, it just okay. and it, it dries, you know, because the pigment is just pulling away. So it it does that in weird places. Mm. So it doesn't look nice. So when you have big flat surfaces, you don't want to use that. Would it work for chaos? Because that sounds pretty oh, yeah. decent for Nurgle. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I think so. And that that's kind of what uh, what I was really interested in trying it for. Yeah, because they specifically have like Nurgle flesh and mm. things, and for um. Yeah, the, for most of uh, the Nurgle, especially the demons, I think it'll work really well because that's basically how I was painting. Anyhow, uh, I was just white basing them and then just using washes. Oh, right, and okay. then for like horns and spikes and things, I would do a more opaque color. But you can just let those washes run into mm. each other. And just like watercolor painting, that weird, interesting stuff happens when purple and green meet. Right. Yeah, so that kind of stuff was really fun. So you get like weird bruising and yes, <laughs> yeah, it, it's great. <laughs> so I went, I'm curious to see how these work. So I invested in, in a few and I'm going to try to do kind of orc flesh and leather and stuff but i still want to do a lot of metallics and stuff right. so i don't want to totally i don't want to do 100 percent contrast but i want to see if this helps speed things up right if you can hit hit it with one coat and it looks okay or if you still need to do a lot of highlighting and things i'm not sure how much it's going to save i would think it kind of i had heard heard about contrast paints before but didn't know what they were and i guess it kind of again behooves games workshop to come up with these i guess faster Mm -hmm. methods of painting mm -hmm. because back when i was in the hobby before getting sucked in shortly and disastrously by that <laughs> kill team damn mm -hmm. you games workshop i remember there being a you know a, a broad spectrum of people in the hobby from people who just kind of wanted to play mm -hmm. to people like myself who are more focused on the modeling and only had about like five models done at a time right i, I think most people kind of want to show up with at least a painted army mm -hmm. so games workshop coming up with methods of allowing people who aren't really or, or skew more towards gamer than than hobbyist mm -hmm. can paint their models fairly quickly and easily and just kind of be done. Um, I remember staying up all night with painting 
with my brother before a, like a quasi tournament uh-huh. because we were trying to follow that three color rule uh-huh. on his massive Cadian, <laughs> yeah. you know, army back when they were all metal. Right. <laughs> and we're just sitting there like hours and hours and hours until like, who knows how late at night and showing up the next day mm-hmm. for this tournament. And we're like, your chaos army is bare plastic and half of the guys don't even have arms on them. Why do we stay up? Until God knows how late yeah, yeah, with right. all these stupid metal infantry. I don't know. That was kind of the end of my games workshop. And I'm like, I think I'm kind of done with this. <laughs> I, I think, and this probably has a lot to do with now they have access to, you know, everyone's Instagram and, mm. and to see when people say, here's the first model I painted and they're just getting into the hobby, right. what they do. And they basically just, you know, all the leather is brown, mm-hmm. all the flesh. Is, and so they're, they're using one color and say, look, I, I'm done. And it's yep. like, well, yeah, but then you, there's so much more you can do. Mm. You know, you can, you can wash it and highlight it and dry brush it. But this gives you a decent effect painting that style, right. just saying, right. this is brown, this is red, this is green. I'm done. Mm. And it seems, it really does seem like they're thinking that way because you can't overlap the contrast paints. Oh, um, they don't work. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't cover up. Like if you go over. So when people very carefully are painting their models in very flat colors and right. say, look, I'm, I'm finished. That's exactly what they want you to do okay. because you have to use other paints if you need to cover up contrast mistakes. It's not, you know, because they have uh, some transparency mm. because they kind of move, they don't, they don't mingle, I think, as well as washes and things do. And um, the overlapping isn't interesting. You just see brown under your yellow oh wow whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. so um i think it's really meant for that that kind of first step before you even think about any of the you know edge highlighting and all right. the stuff that they they have tutorials for all the that first stuff thing. i used to be able to do right, <laughs> right. yeah so I'm, I'm curious to to try these and i don't know if it's going to be a, an interesting or useful tool for how i want to paint right. but i think it'll be if i just kind of like i'll do this army in this way mm. and i was like oh this doesn't look great it's not the end of the world yeah mm. it's it would just kind of a an attempt to uh to utilize these new tools and see if they are just for if they're strictly a beginner paint and they're strictly yeah. you know only going to work with, with one possibly strictly a beginner paint are the beginner prices for gw no yes yes yeah so in japan they're a thousand yen a pot yeah, and but they're pretty big pots, though. Okay, pretty the, big pots. Yeah, they're kind of. I don't think they're quite as big as the double size that they're right. making now, but they're they're larger than the the like one point five. Right, right. <laughs> Whatever. Other question. Yes. Do the caps snap on properly? Because I remember <laughs> so many times opening my pot of paint and going, "Oh, it dried out," because you didn't yeah. engineer caps that snap properly. Right. right. They look pretty similar. I mean, they're doing okay because the caps are kind of flexible. Right. So okay. even if you get some dried paint around oh, the edge, paint you of can my still paint's existence. <laughs> right. It seems like you can still kind of squeeze it on. But yeah, it looks pretty much the same. And I have no idea like what the bad version is. It does look, though, like they don't mix particularly mm. well. Because looking at the bottom of some of the colors, it there's just white. There's just oh, like, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you got to like drop yeah. a BB in there or something to mm, shake it up. Maybe, yeah. yeah. There might be something that you need to get it to to really be um, well mixed because they've got a couple of different... I'm sure Games Workshop will come up with a miniature paint shaker. <laughs> right. <laughs> And it'll be very reasonably priced. I'm sure. Oh, yeah, reasonably priced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that, that'll be the adventure of, uh, I guess, probably over this holiday. We've got the mm. Obon holiday coming. So I'll do. I'll have some time at home and do a little bit of that. Yeah, I'll be at work. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll have the apartment to myself for a couple of days. So I've got a good holiday, too. Nice. Oh, and also, I was taking a look at the um, the Witcher. I was playing a little bit of The Witcher 3 that was super cheap on uh, PlayStation. So playing a little bit of that and uh, really like that setting and they just uh, they're working on an on RPG. I thought it was out. Yeah, uh, it or I saw something on drive through RPG. For free RPG day, they released a um, what they called easy mode, so okay. kind of their starting adventure. And it may be out already because I've I've been kind of holding onto this mm. for a while. Things kept getting in the way, but uh, it may be out already because I know it's coming out like summer or fall. Maybe oh, yeah, it probably was August, so it could be out already. Yeah, maybe. So the full version of it, but the setting is very interesting because it's not the Tolkien, right. Scandinavia, Celtic lore. It's more Eastern European. Okay. So there's a lot more you know curses and witchcraft and dark yeah. magic. And but it's not grim dark. I wouldn't call the setting necessarily you know grim dark, but it has a, a very different flavor. A more because it's a Polish developer, so a much more different flavor. A Polish writer. I'm sorry. It's mm. based on the novels of a Polish writer who actually hates the video game. Oh really? <laughs> Okay. The, the setting's very a nice kind of interesting flavor and it shows you like how broad the actual experience of kind of you know middle ages your mm. medieval kind of european is and uh, so that was one thing that uh, made me think about a topic is do you think that rpg settings and things like this are actually a good way to share kind of unfamiliar or not well-known cultures so that people can actually participate in something or are do they necessarily have to be too 
idealized or kind of too altered to make them playable. I mean, hmm, interesting. It- that would be an interesting topic. And unfortunately, I think my answer would be it depends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because I can see, I mean, there's, there's any number of, of tabletop RPGs that are based on kind of the mythology or, or kind of folk tales and, and legends of, of different cultures more or less successful and kind of better or worse than than other ones and i can't think of any specifics for some of them it might be hard to come up with what the characters do Mm -hmm. and rather than setting i i've seen people try and pitch games more as okay great that's great setting what do you do Mm -hmm. in this game as characters what do you do any number of times I've, i've watched a media or consuming them like oh that setting's awesome and then and what do the characters do i have no idea which means the game won't work right, right? so might as well just throw it out <laughs> so i think as long as the characters could have something to do in that mythology or you mm-hmm. can kind of find some ways for them to, to interact which is maybe why things like a greek and norse mythology are, are some of the not better ones but the easier ones because the gods are always kind of poking around mortals you know mm-hmm. and, and so there's there's things you can have characters do right I mean, it'd be really hard to do one in, uh, I was, was going to say kind of like a modern religion like <clears throat> Christianity, where not, there's not a lot of interaction. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Oh, then I, then I suppose, actually, I take that back, because I thought it would be interesting to play in a game where it's not D&D-ish in terms of, or in, in meaning that you don't actually know gods mm-hmm. exist, and it's a bit just more kind of faith, actually faith-based. Mm. I think that might be an interesting thing to explore and... Uh, you know, whether or not that that's helpful because you want to, I think it is a vehicle for mm. giving people the opportunity to say, yeah, but no, in this culture, they don't do that. And you have to get your head around that. Like, mm-hmm. how would I play a character that, you know, all, all marriage is, uh, uh, you know, pre-assigned from birth or, you know, you have like it, it, there's a weird kind of gender roles that are very opposite of your culture that you have to kind of. Oh, you mean yeah. the one that were originally there before <laughs> everything got colonized? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so those sorts of things that make it more thoughtful. Because role playing does have that built in, where you're trying to figure your way out around in a world, and if it's a, a, if it's based on real cultures or real experiences, I think that would be fun to bring into. It would be. I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of pitfalls in that, mm-hmm. I guess, in doing it. And the big one is, well, if you're going to write about uh, a culture, then make sure you actually have writers from that culture, yes, rather than trying to be oh, right. Uh, you know, I th- you know. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point because that's the danger. Is you're if you're making it as entertainment, then you're not mm-hmm. going to be very true to it, and you're kind of going to be almost parody. You know, yeah, it's going to yeah. be yeah. So that's that's a line that you have to be careful of. Yeah, I, yeah. But I think that there is something good there. Mm, and just yeah. like you have, you know, historians, people that study the history of China that are not Chinese, I think there is, if you approach it academically and thoughtfully, I think you can avoid some of the, um, some of the other, you know, lo- looking at it as other, looking at it as wrong, you know, the Occidental versus mm. Oriental. <laughs> I think in, in that example, you kind of run into the problem of why are the quote experts mm-hmm. on this culture not actually from the mm-hmm. culture? I mean, you do kind of academically, okay, whoever studies this culture, sure, they would be a better voice on it than I am because I don't right. know anything about it. Right, right. But then you're still kind of like, okay, well, and I'm explaining this very poorly, mm. why would why is this person, despite having studied it, mm-hmm. why is their voice more important than someone who might have actually lived or be a part oh. of that culture? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think they... And that's, that's not yeah. what you were saying. But yeah, I'm yeah. saying kind of that yeah. is another potential danger. Right, right. Even if you have an academic writer, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. having them write it kind of elevates their voice more than someone who's actually mm. yeah, lived it. That's true. And they are coming from their own experiences, their own lens. So that it's going to be a translation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. not... That's it, a yeah. good way of putting yeah, it. It's, it's translation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that is the, the danger and the difficulty. And I think um, at least being humble or aware of that and, and knowing that we will make these mistakes. And if this is actually offensive or if this is actually ugly, you know, what yep. we've got problematic, yeah, what, what we've done then uh, to be able to step back from that. Yeah. That's why you hire sensitivity readers. You know, that's a good point. So for Kickstarters this week, I wanted to mention the Hope RPG by Corey Beatty. The thing that really appealed to me, it has a really modest campaign goal. So it was only a $500 goal, which they've already reached. And it's a post-apocalyptic setting that's based on an engine he's been working on. And it's a uh, D10 roll under mechanic. And the setting basically said either kind of a, a frozen wasteland or a desert wasteland. So maybe similar to Canada or Mexico flat, uninhabited areas. And so your job is to rebuild the settlement of hope. So the the name from the uh, RPG is the name of your settlement. It's got really nice art, and they're going to print it as a small format, um, at-cost book. So I think like a A5 or B6, whatever the 
the kind of booklet size is on drive through RPG, the minimum pledge for just the PDF is $5. And they already said in the uh, the campaign itself is that this is basically the first setting for that they've play tested very well with this engine. And they already have the art, they already have everything ready to go with this game. So the, the money from the Kickstarter is basically going to allow him to publish this engine so to be able to use for other settings and things. So take a look at that. We'll put a link in the description. So that's the Hope RPG on Kickstarter. So how can people find you? Uh, on Twitter, as always. And mm-hmm. that's at HiveMind, H-Y-V-E-M-Y-N-D. Um, I guess I'm also tackling on Instagram. Uh, I'm also a little bit on Facebook too, but... Mm-hmm. Twitter's the place to find me. Fantastic Fate Patreon is at F A E underscore fantasy on Twitter, or Fantastic Fate Resources on either Patreon or that's the blog address as well. Mm-hmm. The theme for this month is Spider Elves, kind of a take on the drow. Oh, nice. Uh, the end of the month, the Aboleth that I made is going to become public, and I'm also going to try and release some Monster Hunter theme stuff with the serial numbers filed oh, off because nice. oh, that's cool. one of the few video games i miss playing <laughs> nice all right monster hunter world is on yeah, sale yeah. this month so. <laughs> and if i if it also came with a time to play it i would snap that up in a hot second but yeah, as right, it does right. not it'll stay on the shelf yeah then moving away from portable it does Pat create hurt. problems yeah because yeah if you can't play it on the train then when do you play that's it that's exactly when i played <laughs> like years ago the number of times i like oh uh, i'm two stops past where i should have done because i was beating this rathalos oops i guess i'll get off and go the other way all right <laughs> yeah, now with a kid, not possible. <laughs> right, right. And you can find me and my cartoons at abusecartoons.com. And I do a live stream every week. So that'll be Sunday night, uh, North American time and uh, Monday morning, Japan time, where I draw the week's cartoons, take a look at some of the comments from last week and show off some things that I found at the uh, Japanese convenience store on the way to to <laughs> my computer. <laughs> And so you can follow that cartoon at Abuse Cartoons on Twitter and AbuseCartoons.com is the website, twitch.tv slash Abuse Cartoons. Okay, and uh, if you would like to uh, find the podcast or our videos, please visit IdleRedHands.com. You can follow us on Twitter at IdleRedHands, the YouTube channel, and also Twitch. So if you're a Twitch subscriber, you get notified because we stream all of our recording sessions. So you get to hear all the foul language and uh, see all the bathroom breaks that we take. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's what people want to see. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to get involved in the podcast and give us suggestions and kind of have input the direction of things as a, and also to kind of help us upgrade cameras and microphones and all that good stuff, please visit patreon.com slash idleredhands. What's the level of the back for fewer bathroom breaks? <laughs> <laughs> so that's all for this week. We will be back again next week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.